Hey guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. My latest book, Kowabana Volume 12, is now out. Collecting even more of your favourite stories from the show, you can find creepy ghosts, abandoned buildings, haunted shrines, fascinating monsters, and much, much more. You can find that on Amazon right now and help support the show at the same time. This week, the final episode of 2023, we're looking at what happens when you find yourself dealing with the unknown, deliberately or otherwise. First up, a group of friends enjoy exploring abandoned roads, but this one leads them somewhere they might not be able to come back from. Find out why in Exploring the Abandoned Road. This is something I experienced 20 years ago that I still can't believe, so let me write it down for you. I don't know anyone who knows about supernatural stuff, so I don't know how to explain what I'm about to tell you. When I was a university student, I spent most of my days lazing and doing nothing. I didn't have any dreams or goals, I didn't belong to any clubs or circles, and I just spent my time wasting away each day. The only thing I ever did was go on drives with K and S, two friends who were bums like me, but even that got boring after a while. So one day, one of us, I don't remember who, said that if we were going to go for a drive, then we should go check out an abandoned road. By definition, abandoned roads are those no longer in use, or those closed to public use, but we only wanted to go as far as we could in the car. That meant checking out roads that were closed because of nearby construction, not roads that had access entirely closed off, or taking Kay's Jimny down narrow roads that led who knows where. We were unmotivated and easily bored, but this was so fun that we never got tired of it. Perhaps the unusual spaces presented by these abandoned roads suited our dispositions. I found a great place. You want to check it out right now? Kay suddenly said one day. He meant he'd found a new abandoned road for us. It was after 2pm, but neither S nor I had plans for the day, so we all got in Kay's car and made our way over. The location was a 30 minute drive from our university, a short distance down a mountain road. It was a narrow road that extended off a wider one that was well trafficked. Once we turned down that narrow road, there was wild grass and weeds growing out of the ground, as well as stones and branches everywhere, so it was clear it was no longer used. I was amazed at the state of it, and after driving another 100 or so metres, we quickly reached a dead end. Eh? That's it? S and I complained before we could stop ourselves, but then Kay grinned smugly at us. Check that out. On the side of the road was a concrete wall that I thought was to prevent landslides, but there was a section of it that was missing and only covered by wire mesh. Looking closer, there was a road behind it. We can get in here. It was true, the wire was only held shut with more wire, so we'd easily be able to get in. Kay cut it with some nippers he'd prepared, and then we proceeded onto the abandoned road. To be honest, it didn't feel like we were doing anything wrong. We could rejoin the wire mesh once we got back, and we didn't think we'd be there for that long to begin with anyway. Plus, the road we had just come from looked long abandoned as well. I figured that it wouldn't be long till we found a tree or something that blocked the way, and then we'd be done. Surprisingly, the road was in better condition than I expected, however, and much nicer than the one we'd just come from. We continued carefully driving along this narrow road for about five minutes, and then a tunnel suddenly appeared before us. Well, it wasn't really a tunnel so much as an arch that was formed beneath the aqueduct so that cars could go beneath it. It was only about four or five metres long, but it was wide enough for the chimney to pass through, so we did. We continued down the road again after that, but 
Before long, the road was covered in stones. And then S suddenly screamed. Hey, stop the car. Check that out. He was pointing at something behind the car, in the direction of the tunnel we'd just passed through. At the exit, there appeared to be a shrine gate. You couldn't see it at all coming through the tunnel, and once you exited it, you passed through the gate as well. We were kind of creeped out, and debated whether we should go back or not, but we decided that we'd come this far, so we might as well keep going. After another 500 metres or so, the rather rough road seemed to abruptly end, as though a boundary line had been cut, and then continued as a dirt road. But what really creeped me out was that, on either side of the road, right where it ended, there were two small shrines. It really looked like a border with asphalt road on one side and dirt on the other. By this point, I was both anxious and excited about what might lie ahead, and all desire to turn back disappeared. Fortunately, the road remained the same width even though it was just dirt, and there were no fallen trees either. But looking back on it now, we should have realised that there were no wheel ruts, and it was far too clean for a road that had been sealed shut. After driving for a bit, we reached an open area that didn't seem like we were on a mountain at all. On either side of the road, all we could see were flat fields. They looked like rice fields, but they didn't appear to be in use. The clouds in the sky had cleared up at some point as well, and the scenery before me took my breath away. But then, I suddenly came back to my senses. Where on earth were we? That road had been closed, so was this an abandoned village? Seeing this place that wasn't too far from where we lived, so open and beautiful, was honestly strange and surprising. Just how long is this road? I thought. And then ahead of us I saw a small black building. As we got closer, it slowly got bigger until we could see it properly. It appeared to be a thatched building. But I soon realised that it wasn't a regular thatched building. It was massive. I'd never seen a thatched building that size before. It was around the same size as a school gym, or maybe bigger. Why was there such a massive building at the end of a closed road? Plus, as soon as we arrived at the building, I realised that the road we'd taken was a straight line leading right to it. There were no other roads leading off it, and the end of that one road was this building. I thought that maybe it was an abandoned village, but this was the only building in sight, and the only road around was the one leading right here. We stopped the car and got out. How can I put it? I had no idea that air could smell so clean like that. The air was clear, the sky was blue, and I couldn't hear the wind, nor even the birds. The temperature was also perfect, like early spring, and I was starting to feel like I wanted to stay there forever. But when I saw the stupidly large building in front of me, those feelings quickly disappeared. What on earth was this building? I heard that thatched buildings would quickly degrade if not looked after, but this didn't appear to be the case here. It looked old and had turned black, but it didn't appear to be falling apart. Was somebody still using it? You want to look inside? I suggested. And Kay agreed, but S didn't seem very keen on the idea. He said he was going to have a look around the outside instead, and started walking. The door to the building was heavy, but it was unlocked and opened easily. I looked around and... The air was old and musty. Hello? Is anyone here? No response. Of course there wasn't. Relieved that it was empty, Kay and I went inside. There wasn't much light, but it was enough to see an open, boarded up space before us. There appeared to be a shelf against the wall, but it was empty. 
To the left of that was a sliding door with another room beyond it, but that was it. It was too dark to see above us very well, but it all appeared to be empty as well. It took quite a bit of courage, but I decided to open that sliding door. We'd come this far, so I had to see what was behind it. Excuse me, is anyone here? I called out once again, just in case. Nervously, I opened the door, and the room was brighter than I expected. There were several windows along the top of the wall letting light in, making it brighter than the area near the entrance. But I soon realised that the room wasn't just bright, it was also quite unusual. First of all, it was just really big. It really was as big as a school gym. And in that empty space, there were five unusually thick pillars sticking out of the ground, going all the way up to the ceiling. And I do mean thick. They had a diameter of about three metres, and were roughly ten metres long. There were five in total. Hey, do we even have trees this big in Japan? Kay said, and he had a point. I'd honestly never seen pillars that thick before. As we looked around, wondering what these thick pillars could mean, Kay suddenly said, Ah. Oh. I looked and there was something hammered to the middle pillar that looked like numerous charms with writing on them. They weren't just any nails though, they looked like sharp iron spikes. The writing appeared to be kanji, but also kind of looked like symbols as well. I couldn't read what they said. Hey, there's something stuck here, Kay said. Looking closer, there did indeed appear to be something like a dried lump between the charm and the nail. It had been hammered there with it. Kay and I looked at each other at almost the same time when we realised what it was. A human ear. All of the charms were nailed to the pillar, with human ears attached. The ones at the bottom had shriveled and fallen off, so it was hard to tell what they were, but the ones higher up were fresh and, very clearly, human ears. There were probably 1,000 of them nailed to the pillar, but even more horrifying, some of them looked like they hadn't been there for very long at all. Crap! <sighs> Kay and I fled the room and then out of the building. I had no idea what this place was, but it clearly wasn't anything good. I wanted to get in the car and get out of there right away, but then I realised something. Where was S? He said something about looking around the outside of the building. Maybe he was around the back. Kay and I sprinted for the rear of the building, but it was pretty big, so it took us a while. When we got there, S was there. He was there, but he was acting strange. He was standing there in a daze, and the next moment, we joined him. Behind the building was a large flat plain, and in that plain, there were rows of simple wooden platforms, with two or three candles on top of each twinkling and glowing before us. And I'm not even lying here, this went on for as far as the eye could see, all the way to the horizon. What the hell is that? Holy crap, man! S seemed to come back to his senses when he heard us yell, and then he pointed out something we hadn't noticed yet. Hey, where the hell is the sun? The sun. Now that he mentioned it, the sky was blue and perfectly clear, not a single cloud in it. Yet, we couldn't see the sun. The sky was bright, but it was all the same brightness everywhere. Hey, I thought this place was strange from the get-go, but don't you think it's too quiet? Have you heard a single bird or animal since we got here? But worse, there wasn't even a single blade of grass on the path leading here. S was almost in tears, but either way, we knew we couldn't hang around much longer. 
We tried to calm him down and then rushed back to the car. I caught a glimpse of the building's front door as we passed, and it looked to be shut. I was sure that Kay and I had left it open when we ran out, but I couldn't remember exactly. It didn't matter. We just had to get out of there. Kay drove back the way we came, and we finally got back to the entrance of that first abandoned road. The sun was setting in the west as we got onto the National Highway, and it was then that I finally felt like we were actually going home. After that, none of us suffered from any curses or supernatural phenomena or anything. But what happened that day was real, and all three of us clearly remembered it. Even worse, when we went back to that abandoned road at a later date, the section we used to enter had been completely blocked off by a sturdy gate, making it impossible to enter. Of course, even if we could get in, we didn't want to go back there ever again. A university student is forced to move into an apartment with a rather shady history due to circumstances beyond his control. But what's really going on there? Find out in... Are you happy now? This happened seven years ago, when I was still a student. It seemed the real estate agency made a mistake with the apartment I'd been living in for about six months. It seemed they'd accidentally made a double agreement, and the courts decided that I had to leave before my contract was up. The real estate came to apologize with a box of cakes, and said they would find me a new empty apartment that met my conditions before I was to be evicted. But whether it was bad timing or just bad luck, they were unable to find anything in time. I think they were also panicking a bit, because at the very last second they were like, if you don't mind staying here temporarily, we can get you a new place within the month. It was a place that I normally would not be able to afford. The building was a bit old, maybe 20 or 30 years, but the apartment had two rooms, and the bathroom and toilet were separate, so it was pretty nice. It was a little too convenient, so initially I thought it might be one of those incident properties, but the agency said it wasn't. However, they did urge me to not go outside at night, as it's a little unsafe. I wondered if maybe some Yakuza lived nearby, but it was only for a month, and if it got really bad, I could go and stay at a friend's place instead, so I didn't think much of it. But once I moved in, I realized that they weren't talking about Yakuza or delinquents or anything like that. So many things happened, so I'll list them in bullet points. I noticed the day after I moved in that even though there were people living on other floors, I was the only tenant on this one. One day, as I arrived at my floor on the elevator, I heard a cat cry. It seemed to be coming from the space with the fire extinguisher and emergency button. So I looked inside, thinking it might be trapped, but there was nothing there. Once every two or three days, I heard what sounded like something being dragged above my apartment late at night. At first, I thought it was just the people living on the floor above me, but it seemed it was actually coming from above the ceiling. Sometimes, when I took the elevator down from my floor, I could feel an intense gaze on me, but of course, when I looked around, nobody was there. When I woke up one morning, there was a man standing on my veranda in a suit, looking at me through the gap in the curtains. Confused, I pulled the curtains back, but nobody was there. When I went out onto the veranda, I found a pair of leather shoes. No way, I thought, and looked down at the ground, but there was no sign that anyone had jumped, and then, when I looked back, the shoes were gone. Several times, I saw high heels walking around on the floor at all times of day or night. Just high heels. Sometimes, when I left the apartment and then returned, water would be running in the bathroom, and there was also a strong smell of perfume in the air. At other times, I could hear a woman laughing on the stairs next to the elevator, but it wasn't a regular laugh. It was the laugh of someone crazed. 
And on weekends, around 3 a.m., I always heard strange footsteps outside, like they were kind of sticky. Finally, when I was on the phone in my apartment sometimes, it was like the wires got crossed and I could hear someone groaning in pain on the other end. As these things continued for the first week, naturally I called the real estate agency to complain, but they tried to avoid the issue at hand. We're terribly sorry, but as long as you don't go outside late at night, then no harm will come to you, so please put up with it for just a short while longer. Well, I did figure out that nothing was actually harming me, and I only had to put up with it for another few weeks. Plus, I was generally optimistic about things to begin with, so I decided not to worry about it too much. But two things happened that honestly did surprise me. When I went to the toilet one night, there was an old lady sitting by the front door. It had an auto lock, so how? Um, I called out in surprise. I'm waiting for my husband. He's here, right? She replied. No, I said, but she just smiled and stubbornly said she was going to keep waiting for him. We weren't getting anywhere, so I called the police and asked them to come get her. They soon arrived and were able to convince the woman to leave, but as soon as I shut the door, she started screaming and banging on it. Give me back my husband! Surprised, I opened the door and saw three policemen restraining her, her eyes wide open and glaring hatefully at me. I'll never forget the look on her face. The other event happened the day the real estate agency called to let me know they'd found me a new place. It was a Sunday, so I didn't have school, and I was packing some stuff up after their call when I heard a rustling coming from the front door. What's that? I thought. I opened the door and there was a cardboard box about 30 centimeters large on the ground. Wary, I opened it and looked inside and there was a rather dirty hand-carved doll. On the back there was something scribbled in pen. A doll that can make you happy. Creeped out, I put the doll back in the box and left it outside. I returned to packing, but then I heard rustling again. What is it this time? I thought, and when I opened the door, there was now a piece of paper on the box. Are you happy now? It said. I checked the elevator and stairs, but I couldn't see nor sense anyone nearby. By this point, I'd gotten used to the strange things always happening in this apartment, so I was just like, oh, again? I didn't pay much attention to it and went back to packing. But this time, something started banging on the door. At first I ignored it, but the knocks were so persistent that they were making me angry, so I got up to open it, but as I did, the knocking stopped. I can't really explain it well, but as I reached for the doorknob, it was like this terrible feeling washed over me. I really can't explain it, but kind of like my entire body felt uneasy, something like that. Still, I was curious as to what was on the other side, so nervously, I looked through the peephole. There was a woman in her mid-twenties or so, standing on the other side. She was extremely skinny, her hair was a mess, and both her hands were bandaged. <sighs> I stepped back from the door, but as I did, she pressed her face to the peephole on the other side. I could see her bloodshot eyes. You're happy now, right? Right? She asked. I was so surprised that I fell back, and for a moment I just sat there, dumbfounded. But she carried on like that for the next hour or so, asking the same question the whole time. You're happy now, right? When I could finally no longer hear her, I kept checking the peephole for the next hour, but it seemed that both the woman and the box had finally disappeared. Two days later, I moved out of that apartment and started living somewhere a little less weird. I mentioned all the stuff that happened to the real estate agent, but he didn't know anything about it. 
It seemed that all these strange events only started happening about two years prior, and before that, it wasn't known for any strange rumours, murders, or suicides either. But then suddenly, one day, strange things started to occur on that floor, and the people living there started moving out over a six-month period. And then, the new people who moved in also quickly left, one after the other, leading up to the present. So, unless it was someone in a desperate situation like me, they didn't even bother trying to find new tenants. Oh, and the reason they warned me not to go out late at night was apparently because the person who lived there before me was chased by something when they went out. They fell down the stairs and suffered some pretty serious injuries because of it. The reason they called it something was because the previous tenant didn't make any sense when trying to describe it, so they didn't actually know what it was that chased him. And that's the end of my story. The apartment I moved into after that was perfectly normal, and because of all the trouble I went through, they even made the rent cheaper as well. I lived a perfectly comfortable life there until I graduated. Oh, and I went past that weird apartment building two years ago, and it has now been completely knocked down and a parking lot put in its place. A high school student volunteering at an orphanage meets a young boy who introduces him to a strange legend. A legend that might try to claim his life too. Find out what in Red Bridge. This happened when I was in high school. My parents went on a trip and I stayed with my grandmother for a while. She volunteered at the local orphanage, so I often went there to help her. The orphanage wasn't very big, being in the countryside and all, so it was mostly a small nursery for children. There were lots of lively children without parents, and because I was rather close to them in age, we got to know each other quickly. So, lunchtime one day, we were talking about if we should play soccer or not as we went outside. I called out everyone's names, but it seemed that one kid was missing. Looking around the orphanage, it seemed that missing kid was hiding in one of the rooms. What's wrong? I asked, but there was no response. Listening closer, I could hear the sound of something rubbing against something. I looked down at the kid's hands and he was drawing. What are you drawing? Hey! We're all gonna play soccer. You wanna join us? Hey. Hmm? The boy's voice was so quiet I couldn't make out what he said. Hey. Do you know the Red Bridge? Red Bridge? I mean, the world was full of Red Bridges. The Red Bridge. Do you know it? Ah, uh, the Red Bridge. Well, there sure are a lot of them. Hey, do you know the Red Bridge? Hey, do you know the Red Bridge? Hey, do you know the Red Bridge? The paper in front of the boy was covered in red crayon from top to bottom, with that written all over it. And in the middle, there was something that looked like a bridge drawn in black. He's a little, well, broken. A quiet voice spoke behind me, and I turned around to see one of the teachers. She motioned for me to come over, and the boy continued muttering the whole time. As I suspected, it was the boy she was referring to. He apparently hadn't always been like that. I didn't know the reason why he was at the orphanage, but apparently the police delivered him there. And... If the police were the ones who brought him, well, you know. I heard that after that, the staff at the orphanage treated him very delicately. They did their best to never hurt him. If he got hurt, well, he ended up like that. Apparently, the kids who ended up in the orphanage tended to adapt after a bit, but it had been a month and he still hadn't changed. So, that night... 
I'd been working so much that I didn't even realise how quickly it was getting dark now. It had been a while since I returned to the countryside, and honestly, when it's dark out there, it's hard to even tell left from right. There were no street lights, so when I reached the orphanage entrance, it was like I was about to get sucked into the darkness. As I went to get my shoes, I noticed there was something shoved into my shoebox. I didn't know what it was, but I pulled it out anyway. It was a piece of paper. I had a bad feeling about it, but I opened it up anyway. It was that picture I'd seen the boy drawing earlier that day. Hey, do you know the Red Bridge? I ran into the darkness. I heard a voice behind me. It was him. I kept running after that, I don't know for how long, but next thing I knew, I could see a light ahead. There were no convenience stores nearby, so even from a distance, it looked bright. I got closer and saw that it was a bridge with lights. It went across some rice paddies and was so beautiful that I wondered if it had just been built. Was it too hard to cross over the fields so they put a bridge here to make it easier? I didn't notice it on the car ride over, though. I thought that if I took the bridge then I'd see my usual road on the other side. But that was a mistake. There was a long staircase, a little too long to be comfortable for the elderly, and I put my hand on the rail. Something cold then dropped onto my hand. I wiped it, but I soon regretted it. It was red. I shouldn't have, but I looked up. There was a piece of flesh hanging above me, Like, a face, a hand, a leg or something, I couldn't tell. I tried to climb the stairs as fast as I could, but quickly lost power and slipped. Drip. Something like red paint was dripping at the top of the stairs. Down the bottom, that fleshy thing seemed to be coming. I crawled up the stairs until I reached the top, and when I reached the brightest part, I nervously turned back. I couldn't see the flesh anymore. Although, maybe it was still following me, but I just couldn't see it in the darkness. Relieved, I leaned against the railing. Suddenly, I heard the sound of an engine. Finally, something normal, I thought. It seemed to be coming from the other side of the bridge, like a regular truck. I thought I could call for help. You know, as long as the driver was an actual person. But think about it. Something wasn't right. There was no way a truck could be on that bright red bridge that had stairs. It seemed to be going straight ahead, but as I looked closer, it was gradually getting closer to me. I tried desperately to run, but I'd forgotten something. My legs. They wouldn't move. Ever since I'd gotten here, they wouldn't move. I panicked shouting things that made no sense. I don't even remember what I yelled. The truck was getting closer. I was done for. I gave up. That was when my hand slipped from the railing I was holding onto. The last thing I saw as I fell was the lights disappear from the bridge. When I came back to, I was lying in the middle of a rice field. I looked around in surprise, but there was no bridge anywhere. I figured I must have just been exhausted from a hard day of work, but the t-shirt I was wearing stank of iron. That alone made me realise that I wasn't just tired. The next night, that boy was drawing in the corner of the room again. Hey, what is the Red Bridge? I asked him. But he didn't reply. I had a pretty good idea of what it was though. That day, the police came to the orphanage. Apparently, the teacher contacted them. Hey. I also realised why he was like that. Before arriving at the orphanage, his entire family was in an accident. He was the only one who survived. And he saw them die. The shock of it made him like that. Ah... 
The boy finally spoke, but he seemed to be speaking to something behind me. Mom! Eh? No way, I thought, praying that when I turned around, I didn't see that lump of flesh there. This family is afflicted by something rather strange. It's not a ghost, nor even a curse. Yet it does seem to run in the family, and it's most definitely fatal. Find out what in... Sudden Death. This happened when I went to visit my parents with my children. We were all enjoying ourselves with my usually calm mother, cheerful father, and my younger sister, who still live with them. At some point, my mother smiled and opened the closet. Oh yeah, I found a nice book I'd like to give your eldest son, she said. She sat on the ground to look in the bottom of the closet, and then stopped moving. She didn't appear to be looking for anything though. What's wrong? My son asked, and then he tapped her on the shoulder. Quietly, her body fell to the floor. She was still smiling, like when she'd been talking, but she was already dead. In her hand, she was holding a book that she had given me as a child, that she was still taking good care of. It was all so sudden, and her body was taken for an autopsy while we still hadn't really processed what was going on, and then we held her funeral. They couldn't really figure out how she died, so in the end, they chalked it up to heart failure. The experience was quite frightening for my youngest son, and he hasn't left my side since. Literally, he follows me everywhere, to the bath, to the toilet, and he even sleeps in our room. But it wasn't the first time I've ever seen anything like that. My mother's aunt, my grandmother's younger sister, also suddenly died one day when I was just a child. She was sitting at the entrance, putting her shoes on to go out one day, when she suddenly died. What flavour of calpis do you like? Those were her final words, and my younger sister wasn't yet born at the time, so I was the only one who knew about it. My grandmother died when my mother was only young, so that aunt raised her instead. But recently, I've started to strongly suspect that she died that same sudden mysterious death as well. And, if so, while I pretend to comfort my own children, I'm actually terrified myself. I might be next. Finally this week, some kids make a few prank calls they very soon regret when it seems the tables are turned and the person calling them is far more dangerous than they ever thought. Find out why in Prank Call. When I was in elementary school, I came up with a game where I'd call a random number and, if I got through, make a prank call. At first, I did this alone. But then one day, I decided to try it with two of my friends. I dialed a random number, and it connected to an answering machine. But it wasn't a machine's voice, it was a regular woman's voice that played, and the message was just a regular message as well. Still, kids are stupid, so we got excited and worked up about it. (gasps) This is so cool! Idiot! You're going to die! I screamed into the phone, and then hung up. But that didn't feel like enough, so I wrote down the number and decided to call it again another time. Then we all went home for the day. About a week later, the three of us got together again to make more prank calls. We called that same number, and again heard the same woman's voice on the answering machine. But this time, I got one of the guys with me to leave a message instead. We were only in the sixth grade, but his voice had already changed, and he sounded just like a grown man. This'll be great, I thought, getting worked up like an idiot again. We hung up and then discussed what he should say. You need to do it in a really deep voice, and really creepy-like, I told him, 
and he did so wonderfully. I'm going to kill you. You can't escape. <laughs> Prepare yourself. I'm coming to get you. Even just listening to him say it was kind of scary, but it was pretty funny and kind of over the top too. Thinking about how the woman would react when she got home and heard that on her answering machine though, got me all excited. Looking back on it now, I regret how stupid I was making him say that. I also regretted it somewhat at the time too, and after that, I stopped making prank calls. But one day, I was eating dinner when the phone rang, and mum answered. Before long, she returned with a strange look on her face. What's wrong? I asked, curious. I'm not sure. It was probably just a prank call. A woman was muttering something. I immediately remembered my own prank calls. I was just a kid, so I thought that woman must have found my phone number and was paying me back. I considered telling my mother about the prank calls, but I was scared she would get angry. More than that though, I was scared of the very act of that woman getting payback itself. So in the end, I didn't say anything. My mother was a bit creeped out, but she soon got back to normal, and before long, we both forgot about it. But that same night, the phone rang again. It was just my mother and I in a tiny apartment, so of course we slept in the same room, and the phone was right by my bed. The ringtone volume was set to highest, so when it rang, it woke me up with great surprise. I was afraid. We didn't usually get many calls at home, and when I looked at the clock, it was 3am. It was the first time we'd ever gotten a call so late. It had to be that woman. The phone was quite loud, but still my mother didn't wake up. There was no way I could answer it, and I thought that if I ignored it, maybe they would stop trying, so I dove back under the covers and covered my ears. But the noise didn't stop at all. I don't know how long it continued. Maybe it was five minutes, but either way, it just kept going. I was terrified, but finally my mother woke up and answered the phone. Crawling out from under the blankets, I put my ear next to the receiver to listen. At first, I didn't hear anything, but before long, I could hear like bugs or crickets or something. Hello? My mother said several times, but there was no response. Right as she was getting impatient and about to hang up, there was a noise. It sounded like someone breathing out their nose. Hello? My mother said again, and again, that same breathing sound. It continued intermittently, as though ignoring my mother entirely, and then it started to get rougher like the person on the other end was getting worked up. That's enough, my mother screamed, seemingly creeped out, and then she hung up. But almost immediately, the phone rang again. What on earth? My mother looked worried, but I was so scared that I thought I might die. When she picked up the receiver again, this time, we suddenly heard a woman's high-pitched laugh. It was so loud I didn't even have to have my ear near the phone to hear it. It was the kind of laugh you could only describe as crazy. I screamed and fell back, and my mother was so surprised that she dropped the phone. The woman's creepy laugh continued from the receiver, now lying on the ground, but when my mother picked it up to say something, the woman spoke first. I'm going to kill you. This time, my mother screamed. I'm going to kill you! Right after that, there was a sound like something being hit on the other end of the phone, and then it hung up. My mother and I were both shocked and speechless. I mean, that final scream wasn't the voice of a woman. It was low, deep, and undeniably a man sounded just like a demon. Once she'd calmed down, my mother called the police and I was scared that something might happen if I didn't tell her what I knew, 
So I told her all about the prank calls. She got really angry at me, but compared to how scared I was, that was nothing. Nothing else happened after that, but it honestly was terrifying. A huge thank you and shout out to this week's Cummy Tier members, Christina, Just Sawn, and Estash. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to check out Koobana Volume 12, out on Amazon right now. And check out our newly revamped merchandise store at koobana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Koobana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on koobana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras. Or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Kawabana Japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe, and I'll see you again next time for even more Kawabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to Kawabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net now.